Um, my name is Courtney Brunel. I'm the planning manager at the city of Lakewood. I oversee current planning as well as um, the development services for encounter. Hi everyone, my name is Jonathan Morales. I'm an associate planner at Burke Consulting and I'm supporting um, the ad hoc committee on this project and um, engagement. I'm gonna share my screen with just a couple of slides and then we'll um, open up the welcome. So hopefully you're seeing the cover slide here for the tree talk. I am Lisa. Great. And um, our general agenda here is welcome introductions and meeting logistics, um, covering some background information um, on the code review in the uh, early evaluation results. Um, we have a couple of Mentimeter um, uh, slides and then a Q&A um, session. That'll be the bulk of the time. Uh, so in terms of meeting logistics, um, Courtney mentioned we are recording this. So it'll be posted online. Um, if you haven't already, it would be great to name your Zoom presence and um, Jonathan, maybe you can pick up from here and go through some of these logistics on the how-tos. Uh, you're, you're muted, Jonathan. So it looks like most people on the call have their names. Um, so that's great. Um, so during the Q&A portion, we recommend that you turn on your video. That way you can just have a nice organic conversation and see each other. Um, but you're welcome to turn off the video during your presentation. Um, and then if bandwidth doesn't support video, um, of course, um, feel free to turn off your video. We'll be monitoring the chat um, for additional comments or questions as they come in. Um, so if you'd like to pose any questions, um, feel free to put in the chat. Um, for a Q&A, if you have a question or comment, um, please use the raise hand function. Um, so you can do that by hitting reactions down on the bottom. Um, and then there's a way to raise hand. Um, so just click that. And then um, while people are talking um, and during the presentation, please make sure that your mic is muted. Um, and if you aren't talking, um, please put yourself on mute and please respect other people when they are speaking. And yeah. And just note that we are going to do a Mentimeter poll. So um, you'll be seeing this information in the next few slides. Um, so if you want to get that ready until we do the activity, um, you can go to www.menti.com and then type in the code that you see here. So that's 74570291. And again, you'll see it on each of the slides as we move forward. Thank you, Jonathan. So again, um, respectful civil conversation and, and certainly we want to hear your views. Um, we, I'm going to stop sharing for a moment, and um, it would be great to have folks introduce themselves um, for our conversation. And we can just go down um, the list. Is Aldo uh, here? Or Addo? I'm sorry. I mispronounced that. Good. My name is Addo Equitas. I'm the chairman of the Panther Party. Thank you. Um, Christina Manetti. Hello, I'm here. Thank you. Oh, what am I supposed to introduce myself or just say yes. I'm here? <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so uh, I've been um, uh, living in Lakewood for about 50 years, and um, I'm especially interested in the environment and particularly protecting the big old trees. Especially Gary Oaks and <clears throat> my colleagues and I have been working towards this end since <clears throat> since last May. So, thank you, thank you, um, Eloise. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Eloise Davis, and I'm a concerned citizen. I have friends in the Lakewood area, and I just want to, you know, make sure that the the trees are around for future generations. Great, thank you. Um, James Dunlop. James, do you want to introduce yourself?
Um, okay, John Boatman. Thanks, uh, John Boatman, Clover Park School District, um, member of the panel for the uh, city's tree ad hoc committee. Um, really excited about um, everybody taking some time out of their day to share some of their comments. Thank you everybody who's actually been submitting comments. I've been reading through those as, as they've been coming in from the city and, and um, I, can, I can tell there's a lot of, of passionate voices and um, I'm just happy that everybody's here to be able to share their experiences. Thanks, John. Um, Julie Miller. Julie Miller. Oh, can I introduce uh, myself now that I, sorry. Um, James, go ahead and then Julie will take you after that. All right, sorry to barge in. I was, I was, I've had a few software problems. So I've lived in Lakewood for about 10 years and uh, over the last couple of, you know, I suppose since 2016, I've, I've seen the destruction of Gary Oaks, um, you know, the 17,000 square feet uh, rule, which um, I think it, 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 it was 10,000 square feet up until 2001, by the way. Um, it got changed then. I don't know if you knew that. Um, but I've, I mean, I think the reason, you know, I've got concern is I've seen what's happened on a 17,000 square feet lot um, where um, 13 oak, Gary Oaks were destroyed to make way for an adult family home and there was absolutely no protection and I've seen the impact it had on neighbours, you know, people, you know, people in terms of heating, um, lifestyle and so on. So um, I saw that at first hand, the destruction of those Gary Oaks and I think it had quite an impact on me and the people around me and I think that was the original cause for my concern. So I'm saying that as in a manner of matter of introduction. Thank you. Uh, Julie Miller. Oh, um, hi there. Um, so I'm actually like a South Tacoma resident. Is, is it okay to speak or do would you rather hear from Lakewood residents? Um, this is, it's open. So go ahead, Julie. Just oh, I mean, yourself. I mean, I've lived in, I've been living in Tacoma for like two years now, and I've just been hearing like the plight of the oak trees. And I wanted um, to voice my opinion because I feel like trees are really important in many ways, like greenhouse gas emissions or like sh um, adding shade or like preventing floods. And it just seems like, I mean, there are some protections, but it seems like in a lot of cases they get ignored. And I'm just kind of hoping that if the trees are protected, I would prefer like the rules to be like enforced. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. And Kira, is that right? Yes, that's right. Hi, my name is Kira Pfeiffer. I do local government affairs for Puget Sound Energy. I cover all of Pierce County. So I'm just interested in listening and getting an update, particularly on any items that would kind of intersect with utilities. Great. Thank you. And is it Lucentia? Yes, it's Lucentia. Um, my name is Lucentia Martellus, and I'm, with, I'm the Minister of Finance at the Panther Party. I live in Lakewood. Thank you. Well, great. Thanks, everybody, um, for joining us. Uh, we're going to just share a few slides um, on where we're at with the tree code review. We'll have a poll, as we mentioned, and uh, that's only a couple of slides and most of our time will be in discussion. Um, so hopefully you're seeing this, the screen again. <clears throat> so uh, again, the purpose um, for the city's tree code review is to address concerns raised to the city about tree code applications, results and enforcement. Um, and the last fall, the city council approved a scope um, to evaluate the tree preservation code. Um, so that's our general purpose. <clears throat> the scope for the review includes an ad hoc committee, as John was mentioning, that was seated by the city council in uh, their role is to provide a report and advice to the planning commission and city council. 
It involves some evaluation of information around the city's existing tree canopy and evaluating the code um, in regards to best practices. And then engagement um, today would be one of those engagement efforts, but we have interviews and discussion groups, a poll and other activities um, that are in the public participation plan for the effort that the city council overviewed last fall. So our general schedule is that the, um, the committee was set January, February, and there was a start to the collection of information. The consultant team started, that's Burke Consulting, um, our firm, um, and we have a subconsultant, Planet Geo, <clears throat> that is uh, supporting the project. In March and April, um, the work, the technical work on the tree canopy evaluation and the code evaluation has started. The ad hoc committee has been meeting and is working towards a report. The current schedule is, um, is through the end of April. Uh, then the planning commission would pick up in May, June and the city council in July, August. The planning commission and city council will have uh, a public uh, hearing um, an opportunity for, for comment as well. Right now, uh, there's a website, um, the interviews and discussion groups and the poll um, active for, for this part of the process. Some of the background information that has been um, collected so far is using spatial data um, that is pretty high resolution and identifying by a city zoning district where there's a, a current canopy and um, the citywide uh, number is about 26% of the, the city um, containing tree canopy zone um, in terms of the share of the current acres of, of tree canopy. Other research has been underway to look at the coverage in the city in terms of uh, the distribution in the city um, by uh, census block group, as well as by zoning district, um, generally the areas in the uh, more recently developed areas on the west side of the city um, have more tree canopy than areas that were part of the core of the city where the commercial districts are. Um, and, and where some of the, the uh, areas with multifamily commercial that have less tree canopy on the east, that is also the area where there's um, more uh, heat islands. This is an area where uh, there's more persons of color and lower income households. Um, and so it could be an area to target um, tree canopy um, plantings in addition to considering tree protection, also looking at advancing tree canopy um, in the city. So what's been under review? Some of the things uh, that folks have mentioned as they were joining um, this meeting, uh, the ad hoc committee and the planning commission and council will be looking at the tree code uh, provisions for exemptions. So residential lots, industrial lots, um, and there are others in the code such as emergency tree removal. Uh, what are the appropriate tree retention and replacement standards with um, a look at native species um, as well as uh, other species, but Gary Oaks, uh, that was also mentioned as a concern. Uh, what are some incentives to make it easier to retain trees um, and achieve the other goals that the city has um, for housing and, and jobs? So that might be making setbacks more flexible, um, parking standards, height and density so that it's easier to um, find ways to retain the trees. And then uh, looking at permits, fines and, and enforcement, making it easy to comply. And so the ad hoc committee has been discussing what that might look like and that's still under discussion, um, but making it easy to comply and for the city to track <clears throat> and having clear, effective enforcement to deter um, illegal cutting um, and to ensure um, that the goals for the, the ordinance are being met um, and then addressing definitions. <clears throat> uh, 
So that's a quick overview of, of where we're at. Um, I'll stop sharing here. We're gonna just do a couple of poll slides that are similar to um, what the tree committee um, has recently taken. <clears throat> and then we'll get into the Q&A portion. So Jonathan, do you wanna share your screen? Yes, let me pull this up. Um, are you seeing this? Yes. Great. So again, if you go um, in a new browser, www.menti.com, and then put in this code 74570291, um, you'll be able to access this poll question. So we've heard some community concerns that have been identified. So this question is asking you, in your opinion, what would be the highest to lowest priority? You'll be able to rank um, these concerns. Let's give it a few minutes and see what shapes out. Are folks able to um, enter the code? Lisa, this is John Boatman. Yeah. I had already done this once before in the committee. I didn't think I needed to do it again. So I, I'm, I'm opting out at this time unless you need me to participate. No, John, that makes a lot of sense. I think that that works well. Thank you. We'll just give it another minute, Jonathan, you think, for seeing if we can catch up. We have three so far, so I think we need four more. And it is anonymous. Um, we don't see any, um, the, although, we, of course, we know your names on the, the Zoom. Um, but when this uh, information is stored, we see no names associated with the with the poll. And there is an opportunity also to take a survey that we'll share the link uh, later in the presentation. We could, um, Jonathan, go to the next one. Um, sure. This one's getting at sort of the, the way you might manage trees through the code or other program. So BMP stands for best management practices on the first one there, um, but there are different areas of focus for the tree code or for a program of managing trees in the city and prioritizing among those. <clears throat>
Jonathan, I believe this code is is valid for a day or so. And so um, yeah. if you're still thinking about the priorities, um, you can still contribute uh, to the to the code. Like we have four, which is um, the last question. Sure, great. So um, maybe if you stop sharing, I'll go back to just complete um, some couple quick slides here um, on information on how else you can participate. And then we'll open it up to the general Q&A. Um, so uh, there's a, a central location where you can find information about the ad hoc tree committee. There's information about a survey that's on that same website and it's where the code for this meeting was also provided. And then uh, contacts, um, Courtney Brunel, who introduced herself earlier is um, the lead at the city. Um, and here's her email address and number. And then Burke Consulting, um, uh, I've tended to be copied on some of the communication to help keep track of, of the comments. Um, and here's my information at Burke Consulting. So that's it for our slides, pretty brief. Um, we wanted an opportunity for um, folks to um, ask questions about the, the tree code review um, and also um, any other information you think would be important to share um, as the city um, goes through this process. So I think Jonathan, you mentioned um, our preferred way is if folks raise their hand. Um, yeah, and again, just select uh, reactions on the bottom and then raise hand. Same okay. sum, then Christina. Go ahead, James. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Um, yeah, um, a point, um, you know, you were, we were talking about permits and you know why you need to have permits and i recently had you know around 1000 pieces of paper relating to all the permits that had been given i think in the last 20 years for tree cutting and i was thinking well can i try to manage this and put it into some database and of course of course the trouble with this with this with these with what the information I had is that it only related to lots over 17,000 square feet. Um, and regardless of whether or not you actually give permission, um, if you don't need permits under 17,000 square feet, there is no record of trees coming down. So, you know, when we talk about, I mean, I'm specifically thinking about Gary Oaks, when I talk about canopy, I mean, well, Gary Oak depletion in, in Lakewood. Um, you know, I don't have access to that kind of data, even if I had to, you know, the Planet Geo stuff is about satellite image, you know, imagery, whether it's green or whatever. So we don't actually have any information about the Gary Oak canopy and what's going on. And I think that even if you don't care about saving trees, um, having a record of every single Gary Oak tree or indeed every tree that is cut down, um, I think is really important to monitor what's going on because, you know, we can have ideas and theories about what's going on, but if we knew what was actually happening, if there was a record of every tree being cut down um, and that was, you know, that was uh, part of code, I think that's very important. So from a reporting point of view, um that is that is that is one reason why i think you need permitting yes thank you thank you James. really quickly um i'm so i heard two things just to recap P permits for everything especially gary oak um tree removals as well as the need for a tree inventory of some sort and i'm curious your position on if we had some type of form-based record but really emphasize the tree inventory portion and recorded 
removal that way um, versus having a, a thorough permit that could potentially get missed? What, what, where would your priority lie? Well, if you're, if, if, if you're asking me, I mean, I think, I think you need to know what's going on because um, I think you'd, I, I think you need some kind of mathematical modeling to know what the Gary Oak can, you know, how many, what, what, how many Gary Oaks are, are there going to be in, say, a hundred years time? And I know it's not, it's not uh, popular to think in, you know, people t tend to think about the next election cycle or the next paycheck or whatever, but to think about a hundred years or 150 years, bearing in mind that a Gary Oak takes 150 years to reach maturity. Um, I think is really important because I've no, you know, I, for example, I notice when I look around that there are very few young Gary Oaks, maybe in Fort Stillicum, it's different. So if there, if this is true, and, and I, I, this is just my anecdotal, you know, what I can see anecdotally, if, if you've got few, and I think this was mentioned um, at last night's meeting of uh, the Ad Hoc Tree Committee, if you have very few young, young Gary Oaks, in private, you know, private yards and so forth, that suggests that the popular, the Gary Oak population in Lakewood is threatened, um, is is in trouble. It might not be legally threatened, but it would seem to me that move forward 100, 150 years, it's in trouble. But we need to know what the situation is, and I think just think, regardless of any conservation, immediate conservation, preservation, we do need a record mm -hmm. of every single Gary Oak, maybe other types of trees, but that's that's a tree that I'm particularly concerned about. We need a record of every single one that's coming down. Thank you. I think, Courtney, um, that's something we can um, investigate a little bit more in terms of the inventory costs we were sharing with the ad hoc tree committee last night too. My thought is that if, you know, Gary Oaks themselves were inventoried and then that specific tree type was permitted regard because we were talking yesterday about decreasing the stem size for significant as well. Um, just trying to think of prioritizing when we get before the city council and certainly want um, for all of this to be considered. Sure. I think Christina was, was next. Yeah, I, I certainly agree that um, there needs to be an inventory because as you know, many trees are cut down without permits because no permits are needed or illegally, there are many that are cut down illegally that we don't even know about. So there needs to be an inventory of not only Gary Oaks, but also other significant and heritage trees. And um, which is one of what I would like to point out is that, you know, you mentioned in the introduction about replacement and mitigation, and really there can be no, no replacement or mitigation for Gary Oaks because uh, they should be considered heritage trees they are irreplaceable. And as Professor Douglas Ptolemy of University of Delaware, uh, he said during the hearing in January that we had about the Gary Oaks, he said that every oak, every Gary Oak at this point needs to be preserved. It's at that point, there's only 3% of this habitat left and every single one needs to be preserved. So, um, uh, and also that, that hearing, uh, hearing examiner's decision, uh, it essentially implies that every large Gary Oak constitutes a critical area and as such needs to be protected under, under a Growth Management Act, of course. So that's another thing that the committee has to keep in mind, that there is a hearing examiner's decision, that these are critical areas. And this has been ignored by the city since the city's inception, basically. So that definitely needs to be, um, you know, incorporated into the um, amendments. I'd also like to point out that um, we shouldn't talk any more about tree canopy enhancement at this point because the committee has been tasked with revising the tree ordinance, not uh, devising a tree canopy enhancement program, which is completely irrelevant basically to what we're supposed to be doing here. So we can put that aside and just focus on the legal aspect of this because that's the crux of the matter. Um, the utilities, uh, they have to also be held to tree preservation standards because as uh, now you know, uh, they are exempt. Um, I'd like to show, uh, if I could share my screen for a moment, I'd like to show a picture of what happens when the utilities are allowed to do whatever they want. And this is at the, um, <clears throat> this is at the Custer School. 
uh, on Stolcombe Boulevard. This happened last summer. This was a large Gary Oak tree that was standing near the road by the sign, as you see, and it used to gracefully, um, you know, hang over the road a bit. And the le the pole, the power pole on the left was the reason to um, destroy this tree. The roots were cut in half. So even though they left it standing, actually probably it's going to die because you can't see it from this picture, but the root roots are all sliced in half on the roadside. So that tree has been standing there for hundreds of years and the power poles have always managed to work around that tree. So I think that really the, uh, the utilities have to be kept to the same standards for tree preservation as everybody else. So that's all I want to show. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Thank you. And I think that's about it for now. Um, as far as the inventory goes, that's actually absolutely key. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Christina. Yes, the work program does include looking at Gary Oaks. Um, the resolution for the tree committee did talk about the um, scope of work being the full scope that um, was approved last fall. Um, for the consultant team, which included developing tree canopy goals. So I think we're just hoping to do both. <laughs> oh, I, I was just basing that comment on having looked at the resolution last night because, I mean, it seemed quite specific, but maybe I have to read a bit more into it. <laughs> sure. I, sure. I think it's section two of the resolution, but I think the main point is we're, the city initiated this process um, to help respond to the concerns and, and that Gary Oaks are definitely a part of, of what's being reviewed. And I, I wanna say that I'm not opposed obviously to, to tree canopy expansion. I mean, that's great. We need it like crazy on the, you know, the Eastern side of the city, but first we have to sort out the grave <laughs> problems <laughs> that are facing the trees in the law, in the code, I mean. Sure. Eloise? Hi there. Hi. Yeah. So um, basically, I, you know, as a concerned citizen, um, I just like to know what are your next actions to improve and strengthen the code and the protections? Um, because there's a lot of talk about increasing the canopy um, when it's not even what the city has tasked the council to do. Um, it's not under the preservation code as I understand. And it's not a tree pop propagation code after all. Yeah, I think um, we shared on some of the slides what what the focus of the the uh, effort is in the scope, which is is to look at um, the tree code and to look at the tree canopy. Um, and the resolution talks about certainly a focus being the Article Three of of Title Eighteen A, Chapter Seventy, um, but it also talks about the work plan for the committee, uh, which was to do the work in the context of of having some information on tree canopy. So. Um, I, you know, we certainly will pass along uh, these comments that of areas of focus and priority for sure. Um, but we did have a couple of other items in the work plan to kind of give that context on the, the status of the tree canopy um, so that it, where there's goals and prioritization, it can be done in the context of that information. Yeah, I, I understand, but it seems as though there are definite loopholes uh, in the process. So like uh, what Mr. Dunlop was saying, if there were lots that were less than 17,000 uh, trees, there would be no record of uh, Gary Oak destruction or if there, you know, things, are, or if say Amazon wants to build a warehouse and they cut down Gary Oaks that are hundreds and hundreds of years old. Right. So, you know, I just have concerns about how we can fix these loopholes so that big business or private owners stop depleting the uh, natural resources, the, the, the Gary Oaks, so that sure. 
so that they'll be around because we only have three three percent of the uh, three percent of them left. Mm -hmm. I would say I think that the canopy goals are, are partially a, a call to action that we can interweave in with the tree preservation code, right? If the city were to adopt an overall canopy goal and then a developer wants to come in and want to reduce trees, we would have to, we would have another tool in our toolbox to ensure the proper number of trees are replaced and in the city. Um, so that's right. one part of that tree canopy goal, but specifically for what the ad hoc committee um, and the planning commission and city council have requested to review and are charged with our exemption, all of the code is open, but the specific areas of focus that I think we've seen issue with at every level, um, so that's staff, public, city council, um, are with the exemptions, with the enforcement, and the lack of incentives for trees to be preserved compared to what we see in other jurisdictions and best practices. So those are the things that are being explored right now. Um, and the actual implementation of those tools that we don't currently have. So for example, with the exemptions, if the exemption was to go away and tree removal permits were to be required for every single significant or non-significant tree, um, regardless of lot size, what does that look like from a programmatic standpoint? Typically you'd see in larger jurisdictions or even our size, um, an urban forestry department. And so how would we create that urban forestry department here in the city? What exactly would they be charged with? How would we find an arborist? That sort of thing um, is up for, is also up for review, but will be something that the ad hoc committee hopefully gives some advice under. You know, if, if we are wanting to permit for all agencies, there needs to be recognition for the other resources that will have to be allocated by the city um, to prioritize the ability to actually make the code effective, meaning enforce it, review those permits, and follow through. And, and then just to make a clarification, when I was referring to the lot size, 17,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. uh, they're saying that, you know, the permits would there not affect. Yeah, there yeah there is. we have no requirement for permits for lots under 17. And that's a huge lot size. So it I'm is, it that. is. It's 100 by 170. So that's a very large lot. Um, and we discussed at our last ad hoc committee meeting, and if you were able to tune in, it is on YouTube as well. Um, even a 10,000 square foot lot size, they did kind of a comparison of how much of the city's canopy overall is included in on residential lots of that size. And it's the majority if you're looking at 17,000. So truly the majority of lots in the city um, are exempt from needing tree preservation. And that's something that's generated a lot of discussion by the committee. And I expect we will have a recommendation to change whether it's exempt entirely or remove entirely or um, make yeah. lot standards smaller. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Christina? Um, yeah, I just wanted to mention also about the permits because um, the, the permits are a problem. So even if you introduce perm permits for things that don't currently need permits, that doesn't really solve the problem because as Ms. Brunel explained to me last July, essentially, unless it's on a slope or a, or a shoreline or something like that, I mean, the permits are not denied. So something has to be devised so that the city is not compelled to give a permit to everybody who wants one. There has to be something about heritage trees. Otherwise, you know, otherwise there's no, it's like having no permits if you just give one to everybody and allow everybody to cut all the trees down. So, and also in terms of, um, you know, whether or not trees are cut down, you know, I think that also you have to take into consideration the impact of, um, somebody cutting down a tree. Because, for example, this property um, near us where they cut down all the trees, um, you know, the, the surrounding properties were, were, were affected. They, you know, the trees were a part of a grove that shouldn't have been cut down in the first place because, of course, nobody was paying attention to the fact it was a critical area. And then there, it's a barren, you know, barren lot. My neighbors, you know, they have their, their lot was completely burnt by the sun. Everything had been shade loving. Everybody's yards are affected. Everybody's quality of life is affected. Everybody's heating bills, cooling bills, it's all affected. So, you know, you can't on your property, you can't pour toxic waste, right? I mean, nobody's going to let you do that. It's your property, but you can't like poison the air 
you know, burn garbage, you know, or tires, for example. And the same way with trees, you know, trees affect people around us and we all benefit from them. So just because it's your private property doesn't mean you can destroy the trees because you're ruining many aspects of your neighbor's lives. So um, also I think mentioned during the ad hoc committee were the retroactive permits. Um, that's also a problem because, you know, you don't do it and then they just give you another, they give you a retroactive permit anyway. So that's kind of, you know, rewarding people for doing things that are illegal, which we obviously don't want. <laughs> so thanks a lot. I mean, do take into consideration private property, yes. Rights, yes. But the trees are part of the environment and the environment belongs to everybody. So they can't do whatever they want. If they had a creek on their property, they couldn't pour you know, drain cleaner into it, right? They would kill it. And the same way, if they cut down the trees, they're essentially killing the habitat, ruining the environment. It's it's unacceptable. So thanks a lot. Yeah. I think um, the ad hoc committee made um, some uh, comments last night about looking into uh, heritage trees or sort of a, a tiering to make sure that the lawn standing long growing trees were um, recognized. So I expect that, Courtney, don't you, that that will come back out. Yeah, and I also expect or um, foresee there needing to be, as Dr. Minetti mentioned, a clear path to denial, which is something mm -hmm. um, we don't currently have, but we do see in other codes. And also we don't really have support even from a state agency level to clearly path or show or illustrate denial. Um, in certain situations, mitigation, 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 but that is something that I think the advisory committee will likely also include in the, in the recommendations. Sure. And, and the mitigation and tree planting, I mean, the more we emphasize mitigation and tree planting, the more we excuse the destruction of big trees, because really the destruction of a large tree, as many people have said, it's not the equivalent of planting three small ones or even six small ones or even a hundred small ones, because we don't know that those are gonna survive. It takes an incredibly long time for them to grow. And you know, in terms of the habitat, what's it called, the, the habitat gap, you know, the, the habitat is destroyed and there's gonna be a gap for like 150 years or hundred years before it's you know, compensated for. You know, little trees just don't cut it. They are not a replacement for big trees. So you got to keep the big trees and then you can plant some more trees somewhere else. But the little trees cannot be in any way a mitigation for the removal of big trees. If you want to mitigate, somebody mentioned, you know, do it by weight. How much does a Gary Oak weigh? Can you imagine? That is extremely heavy wood. Imagine how many baby trees you would have to plant to compensate for the loss of that material underneath the ground too, the roots and the top. Three baby trees do not compensate for that loss. So it's really something to consider extremely seriously because as Professor Ptolemy said, every large Gary Oak must be preserved at this point. And no baby trees, even baby Gary Oak trees, even in five gallon pots, they're not gonna make up for it. So please, please pay attention to this and consider it because it's extremely important. Thank you. Are there other folks um, that have comments or questions they wanna share? We still have about 10 minutes. Uh, Christina? If nobody else has anything to, to add, I mean, at least so far, I just wanted to ask when the committee would be presented with the hearing examiner's decision and the implications of that decision. Because I don't, nobody has mentioned the hearing examiner's decision yet. Um, we, we've been developing the packets based on the, the topics and we're now getting into the code um, and enforcement. So Courtney, it seems like um, we, can, we can share um, information about uh, tree permit 
No, no. You, you don't know what the hearing examiner's decision was. You didn't hear about that. No, we have it. I'm just saying. But uh, have you read it? Do you know what it was about? Do you know what it said? I've, I've, I've skimmed it. Yes, it's about a particular permit. We're asking the committee to look. No, more. it's just the implications are not just about a particular permit. It has implications for all of the Gary Oaks. And it's extremely important. I mean, it has great implications. Sure. So, and it's not about a permit. It's not, it falls under the critical areas section of the code. So when you talk about critical areas, you will have to take into account what that hearing examiner said, because he's gonna say it over and over again at all the appeals. We are looking at codes connected to the tree preservation regulations, including the critical areas. I was just responding to the, how are we giving information to the, the tree committee? As we get to the, the topics in the code, we've been providing background information and everything that has been submitted, including your comment letter with that attached decision has been given to the, the tree committee. So that that's what I was responding to. Oh, yeah. oh, I understand that, but I thought maybe you would have familiarized yourself even before I sent it to the committee. I thought somebody would have given it to you since it's so important. And we I have, have read we it. Been, <laughs> thank you, Christina. We have been given um, a lot of background information from the city and shared it among our team. So thank you. Addo? Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm driving. We cover the entire state of Washington, and unfortunately, we're very busy. Um, I would like to. start with a specification at Hawk committee, just at the uh, general process that I've seen so far. We have seen every bureaucratic method and every legal manipulation possible to ensure that these trees continue to get cut down in the name of capitalism, in the name of quote unquote progress, whatever the 10 word answer is for that day. They say that they are still looking into things. I've heard today, we're still looking at this. We're still looking at this, but things are getting cut down still. If I'm building a chair, I don't cut until I've measured it seems like the city is still measuring. So why are we cutting? We talk about adding to the, the tree canopy. If I'm adding to my house, I'm not gonna go and obliterate my kitchen to do that. That's remodeling or renovating, not adding on. Cutting down one Gary Oak tree and putting up three baby trees is nothing. It's a manipulation. It's saying, hey, look what we did in its stead. Who knows if those trees will have the ability to mature? 150 years is a long time. So it's not given the environmental benefits that the current one Gary Oak tree that's being cut down is currently giving. It's not giving the personal benefits to the community. There's been talk about the permits. I completely agree with Christina. What is the point of a permit if it's never denied? Now going to the people, because I'm not a scientist. I'm just here for the people. People ask the communities misleading questions. Would we be okay with cutting down 10 trees to create a thousand jobs? What thousand jobs? Of course, people are going to say yes to that. But the problem is those thousand jobs are not identified 
because the businesses, the buildings, everything that these trees are being cut down for, this warehouse where it started, oh, we're going to cut down these trees, but we're going to build this huge warehouse. There was no company identified to go into it. What jobs are we creating? There are buildings already out there that are not being used. Use them. If we can't use them, break those down. Build something else that is usable. We've all driven down the, steep, the streets of Lakewood and seen building after building after building closed up, boarded, and not used for it seems like years now. Why are those still sitting there? And yet we're talking about cutting down more trees. What is the point in this? So once again, this is not directed at you. This is directed at the city. The city created the ad hoc committee. I understand that you report to the city council. Okay. The city council reports to the people and it's time for people to start remembering that. The people need to be informed. The people need to be able to make the decision. And when we're talking about science, it's important that the science is done before the information is provided to the people because that is a manipulation. So stop it. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. <clears throat> Christina, did you have yeah, more to add? I, yeah, just a tiny thing. I just want to agree with Ada that it's quite shocking that the city went to great lengths to populate the committee, yet there is no scientist with any true knowledge of trees or specifically even Gary Oak trees or, or anything. There, there's nobody, there's no voice of science on the committee, which is really outrageous. So that's another another little thing to keep in mind, maybe, maybe somebody should be added before the process is over. The scientist, I'm sure that there were scientists among the applicants, but they weren't chosen. So I'm not sure what the reason was for that. I mean, it's a pity, but probably before it's done, maybe you could think about adding somebody who has some actual expertise. Just a couple of process points. I know um, the city, uh, has given us direction to keep to the schedule as much as possible to try to to get you know the updated policies and code in place as soon as possible this year um, using the legislative process that we have that that is um, based in in state law and the city code um, in terms of having uh, scientific information we um, have invited uh, for example, last night, the, the WDFW habitat biologist, um, and we are passing along all the information that we're, we're seeing um, that, that folks have provided from scientific studies. Um, and there will be other agency review opportunities. So I don't know, Courtney, if there's anything else you wanna add there, but. but there, <laughs> there needs to be input on the committee from a scientist because you can't guarantee that the people are gonna read all that stuff. They're not gonna know what to make of all that stuff. There has to be a voice of science on the committee. And um, also six meetings, you know, and I told my, you know, contacts who have experience in this kind of um, amendment process, uh, they said it's ludicrous to expect to have quality amendments done in six, six meetings of a committee. It's a process that should take, you know, like much longer. So hopefully, um, hopefully something can get done, but I'm, you know, it's rather brief. Thank you. Well, I think um, we're closing in at the end of the hour. Courtney, I wanted to give you a chance to say any other words. I was, oh, John, are you wanting to share before we do our closing? No, comments? no, I just wanted to show my face so that the folks here that have been sharing their, their views and things know that I've been sitting here and, and listening and just want to come back before you close it off. I don't, I don't have any comments other than to thank everybody for their time and expressing their passion about, about this, this topic. 
on. I also just want to extend my thanks to everyone for attending and for discussing um, with us. And I appreciate the interactive dialogue. And to, to the point of the timeline, I can tell you as a, somebody who's been through several code amendments, this is a very fast one. And I do think that it is in an effort to get some um, regulations adopted as soon as possible. And we are, at the, in terms of the makeup of the committee, I was not involved in that process beyond collecting the applications. That was something that was done by the city council um, and by a subcommittee formed by the city council. So I can't speak any further to that. Um, but I, I can say that we are working with, as Lisa mentioned, WDFW, um, and we'll continue to engage with agencies and provide as many opportunities as we can um, for folks to be able to interact and engage as we move through the Planning Commission and City Council in hopes that we can get the regulations that clearly have some flaws um, amended as soon as, soon as we can. Um, Mr. Masters, I talked to him by chance uh, before the meeting and um, he, uh, he, he said that, well, he didn't know about it ahead of time and he, it wasn't really sure whether he could attend because he had another meeting and that he was just going to listen. So that's not really the kind of participation I was. It's nice to have him there to show, right? That's kind of nice window dressing, but to have him really participate, he has to know about it ahead of time. He has to prepare, he has to present something, be able to field questions. So what happened last night does not really constitute a science on the committee, a scientist visiting the committee really, so. Yeah, and I'm not, I'm not sure what to say in response to that besides that, um, there are several meetings between my, Mr. Masters and myself regarding the meeting times for the ad hoc committees. I know that um, everyone has been really taxed and he had mentioned that they recently just hired some additional staff. And so um, perhaps he had been overscheduled. I'm, I'm not quite sure, but he has certainly been invited to the ad hoc committee meetings. And I know that he will be attending as well on the 26th. And he, he is a great person to come. I mean, that's that's a great, really wonderful person to have um, attending if he can do that. So thanks for getting him on board. <laughs> well, uh, we are at the one o'clock time. Um, we will be sharing more um, at the project website. Um, any future opportunities we are talking about uh, potentially another um, session like this in early May. Um, Jonathan has put in the chat the links to the tree committee uh, website and the survey um, poll that we have out to the general community right now too. So I also want to share my thanks for spending your, your lunch hour with us. Um, and as always, if you have written comments you want to share, we're um, looking at those um, as Mr. Boatman said, and we're passing those along the, to the committee um, as we go. So you have a nice sunny afternoon. Thanks a lot for organizing it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all.